what is true spirituality? Uh, Francis Schaeffer, years ago, defined it in his book, True Spirituality, in this fashion. He says, we do not come to true spirituality or the true Christian life merely by keeping a list. That's what a legalist would say. But neither do we come to it merely by rejecting the list and then shrugging our shoulders and living a looser life. However, he says, eventually the Christian life is, uh, and true spirituality are not to be seen as outward, but inward. It's an inward change. Inward, in your heart, in your mind. This is exactly what Paul talks about in uh, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Uh, uh, as he shifts gears in the book of Romans, that's like a hinge chapter that takes you uh, away from the doctrine of justification by faith. Now that you have this unique standing before God, he's given you his holiness, his righteousness. Now what do you do? What are you supposed to be doing? So he, he talks uh, in chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, by way of review, uh, that as a Christian, uh, you should be availing yourself of uh, sacrificing things. Uh, in your life to, to do godly things. Uh, you should be not conforming your life to the ways of the world, uh, the thinking of the world. And you, sh you should be uh, allowing your life to be transformed by God into his, his likeness. Uh, but those are kind of abstract things. Uh, as Paul talks about spirituality, uh, he's absolutely talking about the inward change that needs to happen. And so you must ask yourself, uh, if, if my wife, my best friend, whoever were to look at my life and analyze it, uh, could they easily say that, yes, you are not the same person you were 10 years ago? You know, I've been married for 39 years. I don't want to be, for the next 39 years, the same guy that I am today. Plus, I'd be way older uh, at that point. But I, hopefully, I would change and mature even more. Because it's all about inward change affects the outward man. And so, Paul uh, is going to address that in the book of Romans. Uh, verses 3 through chapter 15, uh, Paul gets very specific as to what you should do with your new position in Christ if you're justified in God's courtroom by your faith in Christ's work. What should that do in your life practically? He's going to land the plane, as it were, and tell you exactly what you should be doing, starting in, in verse 12. So if you were lost somewhat in the providence of God, uh, uh, election of God, the predestination of God, justification by faith, all the heavy doctrinal things we've talked about, uh, you're going to love uh, this, the practicality of chapter 12 through 15, because he's going to tell you what you should do with your new, newfound faith. Now, what I'm going to do today is, is show you what I think is the, the motif of verses 3 to 8, and I'm going I'm to preface it by saying it's not going to be grammatical, so don't hyperventilate at me. Okay? Okay, okay thank you. Rhetorical answer. I'm demanding a response to the question. So here's what I think Paul's getting at in verses 3 to 8 when you look at this transformative, nonconformative, sacrificial life. He's basically going to call us... Uh, uh, to a practical living and, and how we look at the church of Christ. So he's going to say a maturing Christian, somebody pursuing true spirituality is what I would call is a, is a player. They're, they're actually using the things that Paul is talking about in their life. They're not a sayer. This is like the equivalent of James, like the person who looks in the mirror, uh, you know, and then walks away. They forget what they're all about. But James talks about you need to be a doer of the word of God, not just one who talks about it. And so I put it together this way. Why? Years ago, Dr. Howard Hendricks, who taught at Dallas Seminary, awesome Bible teacher, said, predictability breeds boredom. So you're, now you're totally not bored because I recouched that statement. So a maturing Christian is a player, not a sayer. They don't just talk about it. They do the faith. They do the faith. Uh, in what ways? Well, Paul says, let's look at three ways that a maturing Christian is a player. Number one, he's going to say, if this is you maturing in the faith, which is what you should be doing in light of your justified status, you will then play hard with your attitudes because attitudes everything. Uh, I grew up playing sports. I've had, I don't even know how many times coaches have said, you got to get your attitude together. You got to get a better attitude because it affects your batting average, the shooting average, whatever. Attitudes everything. Uh, Michael Jordan, I'm assuming we still remember him, do we not? Yeah. Yes. Because I threw in Clint, Clint Eastwood one day, and a young guy came up to me and said, hey, like, who's that? <laughs> it's unbelievable. So I, I'm not going to assume you know Michael Jordan. Uh, now, whenever you watched him play basketball, it was like, Beautiful. it was unbelievable. Like, he would go up to take a shot, and as he's airborne, everybody else is airborne, they all fall down, and he's still airborne. <laughs> looking around with the ball, and he finally takes the shot, and you're like, how does he do that? Well, Air Jordan, thank you so much. I forgot about those shoes. Yeah, did they actually help you, by the way? No? Um, but anyway, here's what Jordan said about uh, attitude when it comes to athletics. He says, my attitude is that if you push me towards something that you think is my weakness, I'm going to turn that weakness into a strength. 
See, that's a competitor right there. Oh, you think I'm weak there? I'm going to work on that and make that a strength, and I'm going to dominate. That's amazing. Now, I know this is going to be a stretch. The first service about freaked out when I did this, but think of it this way. This equation works. Just go with it, okay? Okay? Paul is the spiritual Michael Jordan. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, some of you are processing this and going, okay. Uh, yeah, Paul's a spiritual Michael Jordan because this guy could shoot spiritually, could he not? I mean, he could hang time forever to see what's going on with the devil and then tell the churches what to do. Amazing, man. He says, if you want to really mature as a saint, you got to play hard with your attitude. Notice what he says. For through the grace that is given to me, as the ultimate, you know, shooter for God, uh, I say to everyone among you at the church in Rome, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. And then he says, don't forget, as God has allotted to each man a measure of faith. Interesting. Now, we like to do grammatical analysis here because it's so important because the, the words that he chose are inspired, correct? So the very first word there is the word for, which is a grammatical connection. It's a gar in Greek, which would be a connective in developing an argument. So if you're developing an argument, i.e. verses 1 and 2, what does mature living look like? Well, you are sacrificing things for God. You are transforming your living. You're conforming not to the world, etc. Uh, then he's going to come down and say, in light of all of that, let's talk about what this means like in the practicality of your life. He says, well, it, it's, it's all about grace. And, then, and the second word that follows that connective that hangs his argument together, that word through is a preposition, which they, talks about the means of acquisition of this attitude. He said, you gotta, the attitude that you have as a Christian should be all about grace. Grace. What is grace? This is, if any culture understands acronyms, it's this culture. Am I correct? I mean, when I first moved here from California, and I went to my first elderborn meeting, and they're using all these acronyms to talk about things, I learned the Army has their own, don't they? The Navy, the Coast Guard, the Air Force, the Marines. I mean, they all got their own acronyms. I'm like, do you guys go to school for these things? And who thinks them up? And so when you look at God's acronyms, he's got one for grace. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, which we all know stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. See, the more you think about God's riches showered on you at salvation, at Christ's expense, he died for your sin, the more you understand what he's done for you, well, you won't be haughty, you'll be humble because you understand like who you are. In fact, the more you understand who he is and what he's done for you, the less prideful you will be. I mean, think about what he's done for you. What has he done for you? He's given you his, the Holy Spirit. He's freed you, you from the shackles of sin. He's made you justified in his court of law by the moment of faith. I mean, think of all the things he's given to you. Then how could you ever be arrogant with those things, thinking I'm all that and a bag of chips, as they say down south, you know? I mean, how could I think that? R.C. Sproul went home to be with uh, the Lord this year, great man of God. Uh, he says in, uh, in his book called The Gospel of God, an Exposition of Romans, he says, we as Christians uh, have to remember, first of all, who God is. That's the truth. And second, we have to remember who we are. He says, if we really know who God is, it should not be too difficult to figure out who we are. When we know who God is, then we know that we cannot make a move in this world of any significance without the grace of God. Isn't that the truth? You know, you show me somebody uh, who is a Christian dripping with pride, they don't understand God. Because the more they understand Christ and the work of Christ, well, humility comes with the packaging. Paul says, uh, not to think more highly of yourself than you should. Is there anybody in our culture that thinks more highly of themselves than they should? Do you know what I'm saying? We won't name names, but we can come up with names like readily. I mean, some people's Instagram is about who? Themselves. It's about them. It's about them. When you talk to some people, they never ask you a question about you. It's only my kid this and my kid that and my husband this. And you're thinking, hello, I'm here. You know, it's just don't think more highly of yourself than you should. Now, what he does here in the Greek text, he uses what is called uh, by grammarians a play on words. So what he does is he, and we said this before, so it's a test. When you take a preposition and you wed it to a verb, what's it do to the meaning of the verb? Do you remember? It intensifies it. So he says, when you think about yourself, don't think more highly of yourself. So he takes the, the preposition hooper and he puts it onto this verb think. And he basically says this, don't super think about yourself. That's the highly thinking thing. Don't super think about yourself. On the other side, and phroneo is the word to think. So he takes the Greek word to think, phroneo, weds it with a preposition, makes it super thinking. Some people watch a talk show, watch a game show, watch The Bachelorette, watch something. And you're going to be thinking to themselves, that person is consumed with themselves. That's 
That's this hooper for neo. He says, no, you need to think about yourselves in a, in a different way um, in a relationship to the measure of faith. Have a better understanding of yourself in the measure of faith. Well, what faith? Well, the faith of who Jesus is. He's the object of my faith. So when I think more about Jesus, I think less about myself. The more I think about him, the better I know him, the more I'll be humbled in my life and my service, the better suited I will be to serve in the body of Christ. So Paul says, you want to you grow up in the faith? You want to be a player on God's team? Well, then you, you have to learn. It's, it's not about you. It's about him. Uh, at my first church when I was uh, 31 years old uh, and uh, went to um, uh, plant this church, um, I still can't believe I did it. I, 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 31 years old, 19 members, meeting in the school cafeteria, and I took the job, $30,000 a year in California. I took that job. We're going to conquer the world for God. And so Liz and I went there with our two little kids in tow, uh, and we were meeting in, a, in a, <laughs> meeting the cafeteria. And I had zero um, worship people. Now, you got 19 people. It doesn't take long. Anybody here play the piano? <laughs> not me. I'm a car mechanic. You know, hey, not me, you know. And uh, anybody sing? Mm-mm. No singers, no players. Well, I looked at the fact that I had taken 10 years of piano lessons. Yeah, and I'm thinking, oh, no. I'm it. I got to play and preach. I am, so, I am so glad for all of this talent here. Do you ever see me playing anymore? No, only on talent night. I might play some Billy Joel or something. But, yeah, I mean, so... I needed someone to play. So Liz knows what happened, the story. They had a, like a vintage 1850 upright piano, old piano in the, in the, in the elementary school. And um, so I would play for the worship and I'd grab people arbitrarily from the 19 people and make them the worship leader for the day. And they, <laughs> they would lead singing. Uh, and I would play. And during the songs, there's three pedals on a piano and the, you, you need the damper pedal to work so you're not playing staccato all the time. And the pedals would come off during the service. <laughs> Are you laughing at my pain? Yeah, so I'd be playing along, and all of a sudden, bam, 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 bam. They'd come off. So we'd stop the service. A couple of guys would come. We'd pull the... F- <laughs> this happened. This is no stretch. Am I right? Yes, the wife approves. We'd pull the front of the piano off, expose all the innards. I'd see the wooden dowel rods. We would have to put them back onto the, the little connection device and then put it all back together. And then now verse two. <laughs> I can't even believe that I started that way. And then I would get up and preach. Wow. Well, one day, as the church got to be around 45, 50 people, I had a couple that showed up. Now, bear in mind, we, we didn't have musicians, so we had to have set the tone for worship. We'd play cassette music. Remember? Eight tracks. Cassettes were awesome. I still have cassettes. In fact, Liz asked me yesterday, because I listened to music in my garage on my cassette player. No telling what this cassette player is worth now. She's like, when are you going to get rid of that thing? I told her, Never. You know, I love that cassette player. We played tape music before worship. And one day I had a couple of really nice looking GQ couple come. And they told me after the service, you know, I introduced myself. Because in a church that size, I could see who was a visitor. I can't. Here I can't. So I went up to him and said, hi, I'm Pastor Marty. Yeah, we know. There's only 19 of us or whatever, you know. And, uh, and, I, and, they, and I said, you know, what's the story of your life? They said, well, hey, we were, uh, my husband here, a uh, worship pastor at a church of 4,000 in, uh, in Colorado. I'm like, praise God. Wow. This is a church of 45. You know? And, uh, and, and uh, he said, well, my wife is a, a talented pianist. Uh, she was trained at Juilliard School of Music. Wow. If you're me and desperate, what are, you, what are you doing? Man, what is God's will? So I don't want to look like desperate. So I'm thinking, I'm not going to ask him now. I'll call him tomorrow. So I did. I, I, did. I called him on Monday. And I called him. And I'm thinking, you know, these are maturing Christians, a pastor, a worship pastor. I mean, he must understand attitude is everything, right? You know, and they got to be humble servants. And this is how the phone call went. I didn't get him on the phone. I got her. And I forget their names. Probably good. And uh, the conversation went like this. Hey, you know, uh, Juilliard trained pianist, you know, (laughs) I'm not even going to play around you. But we could really use you on a Sunday morning. And your husband, totally gifted with worship. We could use him as the worship leader because I don't have one. So while you are being placed in another church, you know, could you serve in this church plant? Answer, no. We would never return there. Huh? Like, why? Uh, and let me tell you the rest of the story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't leave you hanging one Sunday. Just come back the next Sunday. Uh, so, <laughs> that'd work. Hiring. Church was packed. Uh, you know, so I said, uh, so why wouldn't you serve here? She said, well, my husband and I talked about it, you know, in the car on the way home. And 
you played cassette music prior to the service. That is, that's just verboten. We, we just don't do that as professional musicians. Huh? You won't come back because I played a cassette tape? I, said, I went into the logical argumentation mode. I said, do you re realize that if you came to this church and played, we could get rid of the cassettes? <laughs> she said, no, no. That's kind of like the unpardonable sin with us as musicians. So we won't be back. I'm thinking, I don't need you. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? I'm like, you are prideful. You're not humble. What did Paul say? Check your attitude. Attitude is everything, isn't it? It is really everything. You, I learned as a young, young pastor, I would rather play the piano and preach than have someone up there for the wrong reasons. You know what I'm saying? It's right. It's, it's right. And so then God eventually blessed us with other, other musicians, and I ended up playing the piano for 19 years. <laughs> it's just what worked out. But you got to do what you got to do, especially when you plan a church. So Paul says, you want to grow up in the faith, be a player, not a sayer? Well, you got to check your attitude first. So how's your attitude? Good attitude? Good attitude? Are you, are you playing as part of the team? Then Paul says, that secondly, in verses 4 to 5, not only is your attitude important to be a player, you've got to think about yourself as a, as a member of that body, that team, this church. And what does he say? He says, well, play hard as a team member. Verse 4, for just as we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function in a body. So, so he says, we, uh, who are many, are one body in Christ. And individually, he says, uh, we're members of one another. He uses this body motif. Now, he talks about it generally here. He talks about it with specifics uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here he's just going to talk about the body motif. The, the, the church body, the local body, or the mystical body of Christ is, is, is like a body. And like in what way? Well, a body has a diversity, but it's unified, is it not? Your, your feet are different than your hands. Your ears are different than your mouth, etc. That's diverse, and they do diverse things, but they all are supposed to work in unison. That's what it's about, unity. Uh, a body is under the constant control of the head, right? So whatever commands you give to your body, that's what your body's supposed to do. Who's the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church. So if Christ said, preach the word in season, out of season, etc., I hear that as a pastor, what am I supposed to do? Preach the word. And don't worry about what happens. Just do it. So uh, he's the head. We do what the head says. Uh, number three, a body, body is a total unit, which is always working in tandem with itself. Always. Except if there's an accident or a sickness, all right? So you show me a church that's sick and anemic, and I'll show you a church that doesn't understand the head and Christ, what Christ wants from them. And they're working in, a, in, a, in like an anemic, sick way because something's happened to that body. So the pastors would need to address what the issue might be because the body needs assistance. But a healthy body is supposed to work in unison with each other. By the way, as a side note, we have a great church body. I mean, God has blessed us with unity, diversity, and it was working in tandem toward the common goal. It's an awesome place to pastor. But you have to be careful because things can make a body not work correctly. And I know this from my childhood. Uh, when I was a kid, I was about probably 10 years old, uh, my uh, parents bought me a bicycle. I think it was my first brand new bicycle. Uh, and it was that kind of bike, uh, before they had handbrakes, it's just when they first invented metal, you know, when they... <laughs> it didn't have the handbrakes. So to stop the bike brake, you had to reverse the, the pedals, you know, to stop the thing. And so I was always doing crazy things as a kid uh, before I learned about the joy of logical reasoning and that I could die from some of those things. Uh, so what I did is I would see how close I could get to objects with my new bike and stop. You know what I'm saying? It sounds like reasonable. And so I would get really close to cars and things, and I would slide and, you know, bank into them and, and stuff. And I had a lot of fun. Uh, one day I was riding home from school, and I noticed the garage door was up, and the trash can was inside the garage. And back, back then, remember when cash, trash cans were steel? <laughs> like, when Dad said, take out the trash, it's going to be like a weightlifting opportunity. It's like, oh, that steel trash can. I, oh. So that was sitting dead center in the garage, and my mom, I guess, had put it there. And so I eyeballed that coming into the cul-de-sac, and I thought, I am going to see how close I can get to the trash can before I stop, you know, hit it. So I floored it, and I was paddling super fast. I hit the brakes. I slid into the garage. Now, I'm going to explain this to you in slow motion, but realize this happened, like, instantly, okay? So, you ever been in a wreck? It's like slow motion. Everything just kind of slows down as you're airborne. So I hit the trash can. The trash can went up in the air, flying, flipping around. My bicycle went one way. I went airborne like Michael Jordan. Hang time. I'm up there. Somehow, and I don't know how this happened, when the trash can landed, it landed right side up, and then I landed in it <laughs> rear first. So the weight of my body got sucked down into the trash can with my arms and legs sticking out. I'm in, I'm stuck. <laughs> and I, could, 
I couldn't get out of it. You know, I'm screaming for help, but it's muffled. I'm inside the can, you know. <laughs> this is part of my sermon. Uh, and so I, I'm like, how am I going to get out of here? So I started rocking back and forth, you know. I didn't think about how am I going to break my fall with no hands. And hitting the concrete was almost as bad as landing in the trash can. I mean, bam, hit the concrete. It popped me out of the trash can. I'm like, oh, I'm saved. And then I'm like, well, I got you know, to get out of here. So I, I got, started to stand up, and my legs wouldn't work. I'm like, what's up with the legs? I'm getting in the command. Move. They're just, I'm looking at them. They're like lifeless. And, and I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk. I had no legs from the waist down. I couldn't feel a thing. And so I, uh, I, I did an army crawl over to the door of the kitchen, you know. Bam, 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 bam. My mom opens the door. Bam. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> yeah. Paralyzed child. Bam. You know. I'd stunned my, I'd broken a bone in my spinal uh, column and, and, it, and it paralyzed me. And you can see I got my legs back, but it was kind of spooky at the, the beginning. I'd never rode my bike like that anymore. Uh, and <laughs> especially now when I, yeah. But back then, you, didn't you do crazy things? Don't be sitting there going, I'd never do something like that. I had a grown man in our last service, a Marine. I mean, like big dude came up to me and goes, yeah, I, I did the same thing with an oak tree. You know? <laughs> Yeah, he broke his leg. What's I got to teach us theologically now? I can apply these things in my life to th rich theology. Well, that, that's like what happens to a body of Christ, right? When something's not going right, false teaching, somebody's on like on a power trip, etc. cetera. It, it makes the body not function correctly. So you want to check your attitude so it functions correctly. And you want to play hard, play hard. Uh, and if there's an issue, you need to address it. Uh, there was an issue in, uh, that John wrote about in 3 John uh, 1, verse 9. Uh, there was a man named Diotrephes. He had issues. Says, uh, John says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to dominate, he does not acknowledge us. Therefore, if I come, I will draw attention to what he is doing. What's he doing? He's spreading evil nonsense about us. This is how they handle godly people. They just attack them with ad hominem arguments to get people to discredit them and not listen to them. He says, and, uh, and, uh, and, and not content with that, he also will not receive the brothers, hindering those who, who uh, wish to do so and expelling them from the church. Like if you try to help another godly person, he'll kick you out of the church because that godly person's a threat to his power base. Talk about a way the body's not supposed to work. So John says, if I'm a shepherd and I show up, I'm talking diatrophies. Why? Because the body's not working correctly. It's supposed to work in tandem with each other. Did you ever play sports? I mean, like with somebody who was a ball hog? It's not a spiritual gift. Ball hog. Uh, that's the guy that, no, whatever, basketball, name, I've played him. You play with. So I played football on a team with a guy. His name is Brian. I won't say his last name because he could be listening online in today's culture. Brian's like, hey, you're talking about me. Uh, yeah, could be any Brian. Uh, Brian was the quarterback. And Brian, he called plays in the huddle. And then when he would do the final hut, 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 and take the football, he always ran for the glory. Wow. I mean, you call a pass play, what's supposed to happen? Pass the ball. And every play, you know, he would, you know, drift back to pass and the backs would block. And then, and then he would shoot around the corner to run for yardage, you know, like. And so we, after several games like that, uh, we decided before the game that we would help educate Brian. That's what Christians do. <laughs> and so we said, you know, the next time he does that and calls a play. And sure enough, we were playing football game and, um, <laughs> and he ran for the glory instead of passing the ball. So we knew the next play, we who are on the line, we're just going to step aside and introduce the other line to Brian. <laughs> and that's exactly what we did. Hut, hut, hut. We just kind of moved aside. Hello. And he didn't do that anymore. Wow. See, it's like ball hog, bad idea. You're, not, you're on a team. So we are a team, which is much like a body, which means we need to share. Yeah. To share. You got to check your attitude and you got to play hard with each other. What exactly should you be doing? Well, Paul closes out in verses 6 to 8 to say, well, uh, lastly, play hard with your gift or gifts. Because sometimes you've got more spiritual gifts than somebody else might have, but use them. Now, he says this, verse 6, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them occasionally. Did he say that? Or only when you feel like it. No. He says you need to exercise them accordingly. Like if God gifted you, you should use the gift. Well, I'm just kind of waiting around for the right moment in this church. You've been here five years. What are you waiting for? Get plugged in. So we have gifts. Now, what he says here, the word that he used in the Greek text for gift is charismata. 
which sounds a lot like charismatic. charismatic. So if anybody asks me, are you a charismatic? I'm going to tell them, yes. yeah, yeah, all Christians are charismatics. Maybe not in the sense of how you define the term, but charismatic in the sense that the charis is the Greek word for grace, that when you become a believer, God gives you graciously gifts that you didn't have before you got saved. The gift of discernment, the gift of knowledge, I mean, whatever it is. He gives you these things at the moment of salvation. And Paul says, we have these gifts and they differ according to the grace given to us. So some people have three and four spiritual gifts. Some have one. But if you have one, you shouldn't be looking at the others going, hey, what's up with that, God? And if you've got three, you shouldn't be looking at the person going with one going, that's just too bad for them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because it's all about grace. What do you have that he not gave you? So he says, let's, let's focus on those gifts, and you need to be using them. He talks about this more in detail in 1 Corinthians 12. So he's, uh, this is not going to be an exhaustive list by any means, but what gifts should you be thinking about? And by the way, how do you know if you have these gifts? We'll use them. Start using them. We'll talk about that in a minute. He says, if you have the gift of prophecy, use it according to the proportion of his faith. If you have the gift of prophecy, well, what does that mean? Well, the Greek word propheteo or uh, prophetes uh, has a two, two uh, lexical meanings. It can either mean foretell the future with precision or to foretell the, the word of God with power. Two things. They're both different. Foretelling the future, like Isaiah, naming Cyrus king of Persia, who will free the Jews from captivity in 539 BC, long before, hundreds of years before it ever happened. That's foretelling. Forthtelling is pre preaching powerfully. I mean, just read Isaiah's words. Read Elijah. I mean, someone who's, who brings the word of God with great power. So I don't think that particular gift is a viable today as presented in that way. Because we have the canon of the word of God. It's closed. We don't need a prophet anymore given us precise words. If you claim to be a prophet, then your word is equivalent to scripture itself. I've never met a per person who said, my prophetic voice is equivalent to scripture. And then what really does it for me is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says that the foundation of the church, uh, with Christ being the chief cornerstone, and we're the living stones built into the mystical body of the church, the foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets. I mean, think about building. How many times do you lay a foundation? One time. Who was it? It was the apostles and the prophets. To be an apostle, to qualify an apostle, to be an apostle, you had to have seen Jesus. No one today can claim this. Therefore, there's no apostles in that sense of the word. Now, the word apostolos means to be sent, like on a mission by an emissary. So you could be an apostle in the sense that I'm sent as on a mission from God. Not like the Blues Brothers, but, but <laughs> I know you're thinking that. But I'm on a mission from God. So like when I came here from California and you know, left friends and family and moved here and didn't know anybody, you could kind of say that's kind of like the gift of an apostle, but not in the true sense of the term. Paul says, let's think about prophecy. It has a twofold lexical meaning. I, I personally think the latter half of the meaning is still viable today, today. In fact, I think it's needed today. Not a foreteller of the future, that's in the scriptures, but a foreteller. A person who can look at said culture and call sin, sin with great power and call people back from the abyss and they repent. I tell you, what does our culture need? Pulpits full of those kind of people who call sin, sin. Christians who call sin, sin. Do it with love and compassion, but they understand the holiness and the righteousness of God. In that sense, I would say that gift exists because I've met those kind of people. Paul says, if you have that gift, you need to use that gift because the body benefits from that type of gift. He says, uh, secondarily, he says, uh, think about service. He says, if you have the gift of service, then get to serving, as it were. Uh, the word for service, I'll give you the Greek word, uh, and then you'll totally know what the word is. The Greek word for service is uh, diakonion. Diakonion sounds a lot like deacon. Again, I tell you, this is why it's easy to learn Greek. All the words sound, yeah, just kidding. Uh, Diakonion, it's a deacon. So what do deacons do? They deke. They serve. <laughs> That's what they tell you. I was the ordained Southern Baptist. That's what they tell you. What do you do? I deke. What is that? It's a Greek word, as I serve. Is he talking about deacons here? No, he's talking about the art of service. So if you, you say, well, I don't have a prophetic voice, but boy, do I know how to serve. Then when they, they have a funeral like we had here the other day, and they call for people to come and, and cook and supply food for the family, and you say, hey, sign me up. What are you doing? Deking. I'm trying to help you here. <laughs> You're serving. You're serving because that's your gift. That's your gift. 
You know, when they have a, uh, they're going to have a women's luncheon here on a, on a Tuesday, and we tell you after worship service, we need to move all of these chairs and stack them to set up tables for the ladies' luncheon, and a lot of you stick around to do that. What are you doing? You're serving. Ser well, thank you. You helped correct your deking. Sorry. <laughs> I take that as admonishment. Thank you. I'm deking. Thank you. That's so, so timely. Uh, when, we, when we say we need sh shuttle drivers to get people to worship from the parking lot down the street, and you say, hey, sign me up to be a shuttle driver. You know, I'm 15 years old, but I can do it. You know? <laughs> so is that your gift? Then get to serving. Get to serving. I don't know about you, but behind the scenes, we have a lot of people who have that gift. He says, uh, thirdly, if teaching is your gift, get to teaching. I mean, you could spend a sermon on each one of these things. Teaching. Uh, what is a Bible teacher? Was well, a person who understands the Bible. I say that because I've known pastors who didn't never even brought it up into the pulpit. That you understand the Word of God, you read the Word of God, you're excited about the Word of God, you can't wait to teach people about the Word of God. It's a fire that burns in your soul. You can't wait for Sunday to show up. You can't wait to teach. But if I took my gift of teaching and I used it in the five-year-old department, Greek analysis, verb analysis, What's happening to those five-year-olds? Man, where'd this guy come from? See, I, I know what, there's limitations to my gift. Now, some of you are gifted to talk to the five, six-year-olds about God and about spiritual things. I, I don't know how you do that. I mean, it's just not my thing. But we all use our gifting how God gifted us, right? So if your gifting is teaching, then, then get to teaching. How do you know if you have the gift of teaching? Teach. Did you hear me? Teach. When I was in high school and they started giving me opportunities to teach, uh, I grabbed them. And I, I began to study, I began to teach, etc. And I had a couple of mentors in my life at the time. Uh, one of my friends was a navigator who poured into my life. And as you would teach, I would ask them to evaluate me. You know, when the old ladies would come up to you after church with the white hair wrapped in a bun and everything, and they come up to you and they say, young man, you have an unusual understanding of scripture. And you, you enlighten me. You know, you need to develop that. You need to listen to that old lady. So listen, start teaching, and God will show you. Just get plugged in. A lot of places to get into teaching in our church. A fourth gift, he says, if you are an exhorter, then get to exhortation. Uh, exhortation, it's the word parakaleo. Again, he takes a preposition and he weds it to a verb. What's that do to the verb? It intensifies it. So he says, if you are someone who super exhorts people, like you come alongside them is the Greek connotation. It's like a buddy that comes alongside you. It has two connotations. It means either you exhort them to live a, a moral, godly life, because they may not be doing that, so you love them enough to tell them, or you are a person who comforts them. That's another lexical translation of the word. It has those two motifs. Someone who exhorts to move away from sin because they love you, and someone who uh, loves you enough to when you're hurting, they come online and they comfort you. And there, there's a, a lot of these people in our church who have this gift. And uh, it's wonderful to be the object of their comfort and exhortation. Because they're the people that send you nice emails, that build you up, don't tear you down. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're not to discourage you. I mean, they're exhorters. They write, one lady writes me songs, wordings to songs. I mean, you know, they, they minister to the soul. If that's you, continue to do that. It builds up the body. He says, uh, in addition to exhort, exhortation, he says, fifth, there are of the many gifts, he says, if you are a person who gives, do it with what? Liberal. Liberality. What does that mean? That particular Greek word... Uh, uh, it, it means to have a single focus. That in your giving, you're like a, a missile with laser lock. That when you see the need in question and you love to give, you see the need, you are locked on that until said need is met. That's liberality. He says, if you are a giver, do it with great liberality. Uh, this particular word is, uh, is interesting. It's, it's a preposition, meta, wedded to a, 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 a verbal concept. Uh, didus is the word. Again, if you take a preposition and wet it to a verb, what do you do? You intensify the meaning. What's he saying? If you're a super giver, I mean off the grid giver, do it with a single focus to alleviate needs. Uh, at my first church, I, you will remember I took a job as a youth pastor in a retirement community in Arizona. Yeah. That's how I started. We couldn't even live in town because we were under 55. <laughs> no, I, I kid you not. Yeah. And I took that job as a youth pastor in a retirement community in Arizona with two little kids. And... Uh, so there were a lot of wealthy people in our church because they, they, uh, they lived on the East Coast and they had a home in Arizona, a second home for the wind, wind, snowbirds. And it was, so, so the church grew and flourished and so we had a building program. Uh, and uh, back in the day, back in the you know, mid-80s, uh, we needed, uh, I don't know, it was like $250,000 for the building program. 
Uh, and so we were get, getting ready to launch that. And one of the guys, uh, when you're older, you can kind of dress like you want. You know what I'm saying? Like, who's going to say anything to you? So this guy came in the church office. He had on, he had on plaid pants, like loafers with knee-high socks, a Hawaiian shirt, and a straw hat. I mean, he looked like a vagrant. And he came in, he went to the pastor's office, and he said, hey, I see we're starting this billing program. I want to make sure we get it going. Uh, you know, I love to give. Uh, and here's a check to start the billing program. So he put a check on the pastor's desk for 90 grand. I was 27 years old at the time. I'm like, never turn a man away with a straw hat. <laughs> <laughs> and plaid pants and Hawaiian shirt. What a godly, I got to know that guy because he and I started, went out on Monday nights to visit people in the church when I, when I worked there. Great man of God, his name was John. Great man of God. What was he? He was a super giver. And you might say, well, I, I couldn't give like that. But God doesn't look at that mountain. He's looking at the heart, the heart, the heart. You a liberal giver? He says, he says do, do it, do it. I mean, get into it. And then he says, if you're a person who leads, do it with diligence. If you're a leader, our church is full of people who lead. Why? They, where'd you go to school at West Point? <laughs> I went to Air Force Academy. I, I went to Annapolis, etc. We have a lot of people like that. Government trains them well. They know how to lead. The question is, do you understand the difference between secular leadership and spiritual leadership? Right. There's a qualitative difference between the two. Uh, my best friend at my last church in uh, California, Rick Seeley, head of homicide, uh, commanded 1,300 men at one point. And I was the chaplain for the department. Uh, when I put him on our elder board, he got voted on our elder board. Here's a guy who knows how to speak, knows how to lead people. I told him, hey, Rick, we need to sit down and, and go through Jay uh, Oswald Sanders' book, Spiritual Leadership, to talk about spiritual leadership. He's like, why would I do that? I go, well, you're a great leader of men, but you don't understand spiritual leadership. So we met for months at a Marie Calendars and went through that book. And at the end of that, this big old guy, he was a power lifter. He looked at me and he said, this, is, this has been transformative. I thought I understood leadership until I understood spiritual leadership. You know, if you understand what it means to lead people and you understand spiritual leadership, it's all about humility, godly traits. We need you and there's places to get plugged in in our church, leading young people, leading children, leading adults. We need you. Why? Because the days are evil and we need leaders to push back evil. Lastly, he says, if you are gifted with mercy, what should be your attitude when you show mercy to people? You should do it with cheerfulness. Cheerfulness. If you are needing mercy, the last thing you need is somebody to come by with a bad, grumpy attitude to show mercy to you. He says, no, do it with great joy. When you put your arm around that person who's grieving, whatever their need is, maybe their husband just left them and a couple of kids, and you come along to show mercy to them, to help them, do it with great joy to give them hope. We have a lot of people in our church that understand mercy. And if you've been given the gift of mercy and you're new at our church, don't waste any time plugging it in because it's what ministers to the body at large. I close with a picture. That should be you. Not playing soccer, but playing on God's team. You're not sitting in the stands. You're not on the bench. You're a maturing Christian who's a player, not a what? A sayer. A sayer. You don't just talk about it. You do it. You use your gifts. May that be our church as we head out these doors after the service to the ministry fair that just happened to fall on this day by accident, divine providence, you should stop at those booths to say, where can I serve? Pick a place. Here I am. Plug me in. That's what it's about. Let's pray. God, thank you for the, the gift of the body of Christ, how amazing it is by your good grace that we can be part of that body. Might we not be ones who sit on the sidelines and critique all the other Christians or think we're all that, but might we humbly serve you in the gifts that you've given to us and help some here who might not even know what that gift is to discover it in the ensuing days so they can use it to your glory and the benefit of the body of Christ.